let's be clear. We said Black Lives Matter. We never said only Black Lives Matter. That was the media, not us. In truth, we know that all lives matter. We've supported your lives throughout history. Now, we need your help with Black Lives Matter, for black lives are in danger. So if anybody wants to comment on that quote, and how, what your take is on that. And I could read it again. Did everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not known for being outspoken of so, at all. So this is new territory for me. No, just kidding. <laughs> but um, what I'll say is, um, for me, it's particularly disturbing that in our society, we are at a place where if you love one thing, that means you have to hate another. And loving being black, loving everything about the black experience, um, supporting those who look like me, valuing lives of people who look like me means that I don't value or I don't place value on anybody else. For that to be perceived in our society means that we are at a place where our populace or people who think that way are really shortchanging themselves because it, it makes you look unintelligent if you believe that if I love myself because I'm black and I love people that look like me, that I don't love you too. Um, they're shortchanging themselves from getting to know people who don't look like them. And they are also um, doing a disservice, I'd say, to people who don't look like them because they're basically saying that because I'm judging you because you love yourself and I'm judging you because you love your people. And I don't think that that is appropriate. And for me, uh, for, for folks to, to discount you know, Black Lives Matter and the, the idea, the notion that black lives are in danger in this country, black and brown lives have always been in danger in this country. For people to ignore that and to gloss over it, I think is quite ignorant. That's my take. Okay. I think I would, I would um, kind of adding to that, that same point, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think that one of the, the concerning things is <clears throat> for folks who, who do believe that um, you have to be one or the other, they, they, don't have, they don't allow themselves the opportunity to engage in conversations and with folks <coughs> who aren't like them. Um, and then that just perpetuates the, the, the misunderstanding, the, 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 the false belief that um, that you have to be one or the other, or you have to like one or the other. Um, I think that <coughs> if we, not necessarily if we, but if we, if, if the world creates more opportunities and people kind of step beyond, or step out of their own minds a little bit to uh, embrace something different, and embrace change, embrace um, having an opportunity to engage in, whether it be a conversation or a dialogue with somebody who's different from them, um, it could open their own world. Um, and just by doing that, it can, that can expand um, and be more meaningful. So. People who may not understand your point of view or where you come from, um, there are people who truly believe that everyone is equal. Like, I don't see color, and that's not the reality of it. They don't believe that black lives are in danger. They don't see it for themselves, so they don't believe what, I guess, the media is portraying. So, enlightening people, maybe showing them some statistics of black lives or sharing your own experience with them might help them understand better. Um, what we say when we say that black lives are in danger. What we mean when we say black lives are in danger. Being the oldest in the group, I believe, I have uh, lived through many things, even in Roxbury in the 50s, in the 60s. There were times when uh, it was hard for black people to even get an apartment. But, uh, Black Lives Matter, all lives, you know, all lives matter, but black lives matter. And we want to draw that attention to the world because it's the black lives that are being killed on a daily basis for no reason, just being black. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's really sad to think that we live in a world today that we have to pick and choose sometimes where to even go, you know? And uh, because we don't know if, 
it's just a scary feeling, even at my age. And I said, well, God made us all, but everybody don't think that way. Uh, and my mother was a woman that marched with Dr. King, and she was the uh, first African American on the governor to Governor's Committee in the, here in Massachusetts under Dukakis, and she fought for everybody, especially women. She was a woman that uh, she received her master's from Harvard and her doctorate from Northeastern, but she had to struggle also. And uh, but she fought, and uh, even when she got to the place, she couldn't actually. Uh, fight any longer, and we had to put her in the nursing home. Even being in the nursing home, she had to fight certain things that were going on. But um, it's a struggle. Life is a struggle. And um, I'm a Bible believer. <clears throat> the Bible says, man that is born of a woman is of a few days. In those few days, can be full of trouble. And as African Americans, we know uh, the history, or we should know our history, that it's been a struggle ever since God created us. And um, now I'm just saying this, and uh, I don't know if you can accept it or don't accept it, but even uh, the Bible talks about when Jesus was carrying his cross. There was a black man that helped him carry it. So some people say, well, that goes to show you the struggle that we have to go through, even from the very beginning. There's a cross that we have to bear. And um, even though we go through these things in life, we shouldn't have to because we were all born equal, but we do. And we have to prepare every generation because it's still going on today. And it's sad when you think you have to send your children to school and then who knows, you pray that they come back safe. So it's a struggle. Life is a struggle and Black Lives Matter. And we have to keep stressing that because it's the black lives that are, be, that are being taken every day. Off, obviously, and one of the things is I feel like I'm often seen as a aggressive black girl when I talk, or like there's just something within my tone that I feel like always sets the other people that don't look like me off. And I see it on this campus every day. I could have a conversation with Tam, and we're like, ah, 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 and like we get the looks. So I guess my question is, have you received that in your industry, and what? Do you do about it? Because sometimes I just want to tell people, like, I'm literally having a great time, and I'm sorry my blackness bothers you, basically, because I know that's the what the reactions are and what the eye rolls mean and stuff like that. And I just don't want to be seen as the aggressive black girl, because I'm not. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just really have a strong face. My mom tells me all the time, pretty tone it down. I'm like, I'm just laughing. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I feel like that's an often issue within the black community. And I um, a professional color, there's always, um, well, there's usually um, a bit of what they call code switching, which happens in the workplace, where you are often finding yourself needing to change how you communicate, um, how you express your ideas. Uh, and it's a shame that that <coughs> feels like a requirement, but oftentimes uh, people of color talk about doing that in order to make other people around them feel comfortable. And oftentimes to have their ideas heard. Um, but I think there's you know, generations and generations of uh, people of color talking about that, particularly in professional settings. Um, what do we do about that? I'm not quite sure. I, I think um, on some level the conversation has to change and shift more towards how can we be authentic. We are authentic selves, so we're not having to change who we are, uh, not having to change our mode of expression, uh, but also uh, to, be, to be heard. And so I think that is a dilemma for most, for most professionals of color. And say that in 
just being of color and you know around the same age as you, um, I can say that's an obstacle that I face all the time. But it's about how you reapproach the situation. So even though you're giving that look, you're perceiving that look to be bad. Even though it might be bad, it has that intention. You don't have to respond to it in a negative way. So respond by smiling. Respond by turning around and you know just greeting them with positive eye contact. It doesn't have to be a negative connotation from how you perceive it and even how you respond back to it because that's when the miscommunication happens. And as a communication major, I'm pretty sure you learn about the different signs of miscommunication that people give one another. So even though they're giving you that look, you don't have to in turn respond that way. And, and so I guess th talking about the miscommunication, one of the things that my grandmother always told me, and my grandmother is all Chain. Okay. <laughs> One of the things she always told me was, baby, don't dim your light mm -hmm. so that somebody else can feel like they're going to shine. Mm -hmm. Right? And so if I get a look because, you know, I laugh loud or because, you know, uh, Professor Frazier and I are in the hallway and another colleague says, oh, hi, how are you doing? And then when the other colleague walks away, I actually start talking to her close with you. Girl, guess what? Right? <laughs> right there, you know? And, and, and literally. We did that earlier today, right? She was talk, walking, talking to a colleague, and we were talking about something with faculty stuff, and when the other colleague walked away, then I talked to Professor Page. I said, girl, guess what, all right? It's not your problem if someone else responds to your presence the way that they respond. You need to be your authentic self in that moment, and whatever issue they have with you being your authentic self, that's their burden to bear, not yours. And so responding in a manner that basically says, you know, oh, I didn't, I'm not going to really internalize the look that I just got or the irony. And what you'll see then is that the communication then becomes, well, I'm glad that you have an opinion, but frankly, my dear, I don't care. <laughs> and you don't say that, but you just keep being yourself. And it's fine. Um, I think there's a sad reality that um, when people don't uh, when people aren't familiar with you and they don't know you or the community that you come from, that there's a tendency for people to project a whole set of stereotypes onto them. Um, and in one moment, they'll build you up and sort of view you as, oh my goodness, this person is amazing. And then in another moment, they'll tear you down. And everything from the angry black woman to whatever uh, stereotype it is that you come up with is, will be projected onto you. And I think, and I've certainly experienced that. Uh, myself um, and have had a whole um, have had people respond to me in ways that I know that my colleagues who were not people of color uh, did not have to endure uh, some of the responses that I've had um, and so I, I really um, uh, echo so much of the um, uh, sentiments that folks have shared I think a couple of things have been particularly helpful for me um, one is making sure that we find um, our places of refuge within any organization that we're a part of. Um, and so what Dr. Hall Porter just mentioned with regard to her conversation with uh, Dr. Frazier is so critical. Being able to have those folks who you know uh, you can have a candid conversation with them and you can close the door and can say, am I crazy? Like, did you just see what I saw? And do you believe, oh, and we need those spots and we need those people in our lives. Um, professionally, otherwise we absolutely um, will go nuts. And so being able to have that validation and being able to feel as if there are people around us um, who will allow us to bring our whole selves into the room without feeling as if we have to leave uh, aspects of ourselves out and let go of parts of ourselves that are very important to us. I think the other piece is honestly I've made choices professionally as far as what are the kind of um, uh, institutions um, and organizations that I want to be a part of. Um, and certainly there have been times, and part of this is I um, candidly have um, some privilege related to this professionally and educationally. A lot of that privilege is earned privilege because I've worked very hard uh, for my degrees and, and within other professional um, uh, uh, contexts. Um, but I have the privilege to be able to say this organization um, uh, does not work for me. It's too Eurocentric, patriarchal. Um, and uh, 
I really undermines the values that I hold sacred. And so I'm not willing to put myself within that context um, because I don't believe in the mission of it. Um, whereas there are other organizations, institutions that I'm willing to be a part of um, because it overlaps uh, with my uh, sort of core values, but also it allows me to be more authentic and genuine within that space. So um, I was just going to ask how you, and I know as a student, I deal with this a lot where most of the times I'm the only black female or the only black person. It's either or at this point um, <laughs> in my class. So a lot of the times there's always that like, there's always that like fear of like, the whole oh, don't make it about race, but it's just like, uh, like if you can't talk about it, how are you gonna solve the problem? Because there's a lot of times where I've been in classes where we're just like, oh, why do you think this happens? And things like that. Um, I'm an environmental major. Like I remember, just an example, just to give background. Um, we were talking about DDT and how like it's not, it's banned in America, but America still makes it and sells it to other countries. And so I was saying that basically it was environmental racism, but everyone else was just like, whoa, whoa there, like it's not that, like it can't be that. No, it's just like they know what they're getting into. And like it was just all these excuses and I was trying to get my voice heard, but it's just like everyone would also just like bombard me. Oh, no, it's not about race. Why are you making it about race? And he's like, oh, well, I don't really. And it's like this tiptoeing factor. It's just like we can't have a conversation and I always feel like I'm being like looked over or like washed over like my opinion doesn't matter so now my question for you guys as professionals where it gets even more difficult um, is just like how do you like deal with that with colleagues or even just like if you have students what do you do when your students are just like not wanting to um, talk about touchy topics I guess because that's usually what they get labeled as so how would you um, go about that on a professional level because I know as a student I could probably say to like another student like okay it is about race like STFU but like <laughs> as a professional you have like this like standard of you so how do you go about those frustrations or problems and things like that? Because they do not want to hear the truth. It's all about the truth. You know what you're going through and they know what they're putting you through. But you just got to, as, as President Obama's wife said, when they go low, we go high. So we just got to remember, and we got to talk to ourselves. Every day you got to say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You got to just keep, you know, saying that to yourself because you just have to encourage yourself. You want to tell the truth, you want to talk about the truth, but they don't want to hear the truth. And, uh, and that's the way it is with everything. It's not just you in a classroom, it's everywhere. And it's just sad. You know, we know, they know, it's always about racism. The race, the race, the race, the race every day, the race. And um, you want to talk about it because it's real, you're going through it. But they don't want you to talk about it. So you just have to just, go along and get along, as they say. And you have one object in mind, and that's to get your education, get your degree, and keep it moving. A situation where you know, like for, for in your environmental class, where you know that it is a race, racial issue, bring up the facts. Come with those facts that prove that it is a racial issue. Say that X amount of blacks, percentage of blacks or African Americans, were affected or this happened to them, lead with the facts and then let them take that factual information and let it sit with, resonate with them on their mind. If they want to say it's still not a racial issue, you presented all the facts, you were real about it, and they didn't take away from it what you were hoping to present. But you're showing them that you've researched, you're knowledgeable, and that you have the supporting evidence to prove that it is a racial issue and you have the evidentiary support for that. Well, the facts that I'm an old school I taught at in Cambridge. I had one of my colleagues at the time who um, we were talking about Boston Public Schools, which is the um, school system that I went through as a child. And we were talking about how it's separated by race. It's what I said that it was separated by race. And um, she she was not a teacher. She was a paraprofessional. She just mentioned that it wasn't by race. It was um, all these black parents all chose to send these their child to these specific schools um, and they don't have space for the white people, whatever um, whatever the statement was she made. And I was like, yes, it is a busing issue and I, um, 
I was trying to find articles. I did pull up some articles and some um, like statistics about the, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the busing um, thing that happened in Boston. And I referenced that to her and I said, before this happened, there were so many white kids in um, Boston Public Schools and after it happened, all these white people, like all these white kids disappeared. So it was a race issue. Like, I don't want my kids going to school, to a bad school, because all these black kids are now in these schools making it bad. Um, and she wasn't receiving that very well. She was just like, no, it's just that um, the white people that live in Boston, they have, she was just trying to make it everything else besides that, oh, these white people don't want their, well, um, back when it happened, the white parents were upset that these, um, I guess, separate, um, the separate, the separation of the school were becoming integrated, so they pulled kids out. And it was just me going back and forth, and that wasn't really, I don't think she received it very well, and I don't think I got anywhere. So um, just putting out the facts and hopefully they receive it. If not, that's all you can do, really do um, to present it. And that was my one example of how I, even though we had a conversation, it wasn't really, we didn't get anywhere. She didn't change my mind, I didn't change hers. So, yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, where do you guys feel like you have the most impact in your professional careers? as far as like this topic, this discussion. And this is very broad. Okay. Um, and I look at their, their advising sheet and just make sure that they've checked all the boxes. I really do take the time to check in and see um, when I get an advisor as a sophomore, you know, what is your what are your future career prospects look like? Is there any, do I have anyone in my network that can help you get to where you want to go? And we start uh, at the sophomore level, just building a relationship such that basically my goal is that by the time they are seniors and they're ready to graduate, or either even at the end of the junior year, they have a clear progression as to what the next five years are going to look like uh, after they leave LaSalle. And so that's where I think I. The previous two comments, and um, it sort of tied into the last question too, in that. Um, I think you always have to make a wise choice as to where to exert your influence, um, where you want your impact to be, and how much you deplete yourself in talking to people and feeling like you're not getting anywhere. That can be really draining. <laughs> and as a person of color, as a student of color, especially if you are one of uh, just a few, uh, that can take a toll on you personally. So um, I think professionally, I have made choices. I, I've gotten wiser about it as the years have gone on, but I make choices about where I want to um, continue to talk, continue to engage with colleagues if I can make a difference. Um, I, have, I have made a statement, this is not at LaSalle, but I've made a statement uh, in one workplace and been totally ignored. Like a whole room full of people, nobody even responded to what I said. And I literally got up and left. Because at that point, I felt like, OK, well, if you're not even going to acknowledge the fact that I've just said something, I'm really going to have no impact on your way of thinking. And that's a waste of my time. So I just got up and left. Um, when it comes to uh, interacting with students, um, I would say it's a little more complex. But what I'm looking for is, um, <coughs> How can I help students, um, you know, similar to what uh, Dr. Paul Porter was just saying, how can I help students get to where they need to be? How can I mentor them? How can I be that bridge for them? Um, but I also do the same thing. I'm, I'm also assessing, okay, what, what's the hunger like for the student? What's the motivation like for the student? Do I have what I need to help this particular student? And I make choices. And if I feel as though it's not a good use of my time. I don't do it. Perhaps I refer them to someone else, but I, of, I often think about what my legacy will be professionally. And so I'm thinking about, you know, how can I, uh, you know, build you know, a group of students who go on to be in my field and to make significant impacts, particularly when it comes to race or ethnicity, but in other ways too. So I think as you go through these settings, whether it's school settings, work settings, you have to start making choices about how much do you do and how much do you reserve for your own safety. Yeah. 
His heels are killing me, that's why I had to sit down. I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Uh, any other comments to that? Um, so one of the things I um, always try to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, that's crazy. You said something earlier about oftentimes you know, silence. Um, I guess something I've experienced and I think that I've heard is too. Um, so like as a woman, a lot of the times I'm subject to mansplaining and as a person of color, I feel like I'm su like a subject of white splaining almost where sometimes the information I know or anything I want to share in my ideas and opinions, when they're being shared, they're almost discredited in a way. So um, I guess my question is like, what are some approaches that I would like you guys to take in if you've experienced this at all? that doesn't look a thing like you, that's in the same circle, that's willing to say, oh, Monica just said that, right? So I'll just give you an example. Um, I was on um, um, a community board, and I had a sponsor in the room who looks nothing like me, and we do not share gender. And I gave an idea about the, um, the uh, director of the center that I was on the board for to start writing white papers. And basically what white papers do is they're shorter like research publications, but it's a communication uh, in the field of healthcare or in any field in general. That basically it's a short communication, but it, it's um, like a synopsis of a program or something that's being done that might be groundbreaking in any given field. And so when I gave this idea, the person who was facilitating the meeting says, oh, we really don't get into you know, a lot of research. We want this to be more of a community-based thing. And so the, my sponsor in the room came back to say, well, Monica just gave the idea of actually starting to write, to write white papers so that the center is in a more elevated or prominent platform uh, nationally, because that's how you get known in a lot of fields. You have to publish about your work. And so whenever he brought the idea back up, it was Monica just said, Monica just said, Monica just said. And so there, my sponsor's voice basically was used to amplify my voice. And so having sponsors helps with that. So in your, um, in your situation, if you're feeling like, you know, as a student, that you aren't being heard, one other thing, too, is also to speak with your professor about managing the classroom dynamic, because that's something that the professor actually needs to work to manage as well. You can't not let a student's voice be heard. Now, what I will say is that it is very hard as a professor for, to um, entertain uh, voices, especially when they say things that are out of left field. So one of my students, I'm looking at him right now, and I just will never will forget in a, in a class that we have, we're talking about the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment. Do you remember that? When the girl <laughs> said, well, at least we learned something, my head went on slow. I said, what? And I had to remember, okay, her voice has to be heard, her voice has to be heard, her voice has to be heard. So I asked her to, uh, to kind of go more in depth as to what we learned from the Tuskegee experiment, because I wanted to know too. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so I said that to say this, as a student, yes, I think you need to basically convey to your professor how you're feeling about your voice not being heard, that happens in a classroom setting. Um, but then also as a professional, it also helps to have a sponsor that will willingly amplify your voice. And you don't necessarily have to always ask ask somebody to be your sponsor because you can be someone else's sponsor too. It's a two-way street. I also like the comment. I think I think part of the I don't want to say the issue, but one of the things I think people of color experience is that we're not just people of color. So there's some intersectionality of like our identities, and so there when those intersectionalities build up and when you become multi marginalized in some capacities, I think the your voice at times can potentially be diminished even more. Um, and I think that that's probably what you're, what you're saying. I think that that's probably an experience that um, many folks face at that time. And I think that, um, I, I don't know the, the best way around it, but I think keeping that in mind will hopefully help keep your head in a place that, knowing that like it's you're not completely fighting that whole battle at times, that you're not like floundering or failing. It, it might just be there's multiple aspects. And the people that you're trying to communicate with, um, you have to meet them in different places uh, because maybe they understand one aspect of you, but they don't understand the other aspect. So maybe they they will get on board with the, your perspective as a person of color, but maybe not as a woman or vice versa. And, and as if you as you add all these more um, intersections to your person, I, I think then you have to 
figure out like how do you navigate those conversations and what you're saying in the audience as audience changes. So if you go from class to class or class to work or class to home, like those, those audiences are going to change. And then the way in which you maybe say the, the same argument or make the same point has to change you know, because you're trying to reach different people. Um, that doesn't completely answer the question, but I think it's something that I have to keep. I constantly tell myself sometimes too that you know maybe I have to speak this way at this time, or not necessarily the, the my, my tone, but the, the way in which I'm explaining it, or the evidence that I present, um, because the, the same topic might mean something different. What are ways that you guys try to do, or strategies that you guys have as far as moving up? So if you're in a particular department if you're in a particular career and you have somebody, you might even have like a woman or a male that doesn't even look like you, probably doesn't want to see you do well, or maybe just doesn't have any, you know, common, you know, understanding or common ground as you. How do you go about moving up your strategies and, you know, obstacles as far as it, let me phrase it this way. How do you face those challenges? And what are your strategies? So um, for me, I was, um, last year I was at a charter school and I was a special ed teacher. So I um, did the pull out services and my goal was to become a full classroom teacher. And there were many positions available at the school I was at and I, um, interviewed with the principal who already knew my work. Um, and I didn't get any of those positions, so I went somewhere else at a Boston, um, it was at a charter school, I went to Boston Public School. And many of the teachers are black. At the old school that I was at, there were, there was one black teacher, the rest were all white teachers. Um, and most of the student population are black kids. Um, and I don't know if that played any part of in it, I don't want to speculate that that was um, the situation, but I just moved somewhere else. And the school I'm at currently, a lot of the a lot of the teachers look like the student population. There, are, it's mostly black teachers. There are some Hispanic teachers. There are some white teachers, but most of the uh, teacher population look like the student population. So I would say to navigate that, you can move into a space that does accept accept who you are, where you don't have to kind of make excuses or um, change. Um, into what they think a teacher should look like or any profession should look like, just go into a space that accepts you to move up. That's my strategy. I think um, it's really critical to have multiple mentors, um, really to have a team of folks uh, who are there who you can look to to offer support. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, many people sort of have the sense of, oh, if I have this sort of one super mentor who can give me everything that I need, I'll be in great shape. But there is a reality that there are um, people who can offer different kinds of things and um, uh, will allow us to um, be able to bounce ideas off of them and, and get different viewpoints and perspectives. Um, what's really critical, in my opinion, if you want to move up, is having somebody who either has already been there, uh, sort of uh, operating within a particular role, um, somebody who understands the organizational culture uh, of the organization that you're a part of and can um, convey particular kinds of things to you about um, the way things operate and what some of the alliances are. Um, and then beyond that, I think somebody who has a broader term perspective, just in terms of um, uh, some life experience. Uh, who basically can ask some um, particularly important questions in terms of what's the end game for you, what's the goal and where you want to go, and what about, uh, in many respects, if you want to go up within this organization, what will the cost be, uh, and is that something that you're willing to pay? Um, do you feel that that will be some form of internal treason where you have to make particular kinds of sacrifices and um, ways that you either have to bite your tongue or, again, you can't sort of show up as your authentic self in a way that it's not worth it to you? Or um, do you feel that there are ways in which 
uh, when you think about your professional goals long term, this will move you higher. Uh, and how do you then move yourself forward um, without getting trapped within a particular spot so that you where you want to get to beyond that. Um, so being able to have those multiple voices uh, and um, I think there are people in our lives who can offer words of wisdom. I think it's also important to figure out what the um, what is the desired outcome for your supervisor or whoever is over you, um, whoever makes a decision about moving up. And I think it's um, important to listen very carefully when you hear those people talk about the things that they want for the organization. Um, because usually the thing that gets you noticed is when you can perform well in an area. And that area switches. So it might not be the same next year as it was this year. So I think trying to figure out, OK, what is it that they're really valuing here? And then how can I take something that I want to do or that I care about and align it with that outcome. So I, I'm kind of you know, giving them some of what they want, but I'm also doing something that I want to do. And I think once you can figure that out, then you can figure out how to work smart in order to get yourself where you want to be, if that makes sense. And I'd also like comment on the fact that in the, if you are in a place where you realize that not the best fit. Um, it's it's okay to to find some place else because you don't want your internal happiness to be um, diminished so much that you can't function as a, as a being because you're trying to to move up within a corporation or an entity. Um, there are other entities out there that you can you find that might take some work. And I'm not telling people to go out quit your job and go research it, but but if you, if you have that opportunity uh, because I think one of the things that um, that I've learned um, is that the, um, not every place that you fit is where you. Um, and sometimes um, you don't know it until you get there, but um, if it's going to be some internal struggles for you and it, it, it starts affecting your own personhood and your own health, um, it, it's time to come out and try to find something else. I'm sorry, I don't mean to stick on the conversation, but I do have a lot of questions. So <laughs> it just keeps coming to my head as you're talking. So. Um, when you came out of college, or as you're going along in your profession, what are the things that you wish you had known or somebody had told you? Like entering the workforce, or like dealing with your boss? Um, like particularly, like how do you get your slice that you deserve? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, one of the things, honestly, one of the things that I wish somebody would have told me, so I, uh, everybody has a, has, a, has a story, and so a little bit of my personal story. I have a half-sister who had, by the time she was 21, she had three children by three different men, and I lived under the pressure of that. So as I progressed from high school to college, to graduate school, to professional life, I wanted to do everything perfectly so that I would not upset or embarrass my father. Because she's my half-sister, so he's, she's from my father's first marriage. And so what I did was I went from college to graduate school to postdoc. No breaks, no real time to develop like meaningful relationships, I waited until after graduate school to get married. I waited for five years after graduate school, uh, after postdoc, excuse me, to, uh, after graduate school, in my postdoc, excuse me, to have children. I was afraid to tell my mama that I was pregnant because as a 30-something-year-old married woman, I just remember how when my sister, you know, was pregnant with her first, and my dad said, "Okay, we can't, you know, that you know, we can deal with this." And then the second, and my dad was, "Oh, okay. you know, the third, utter embarrassment for the family." So much so that my older brother told my sister, "If we were in a different society, I could take you behind the barn and shoot you, and Daddy would not be upset because you dishonored our family." Like that much dysfunction from my half sister. If I had to do it all over again, I wish somebody would have told me that my life 
is mine. And I don't have to be ashamed of the family legacy or live in the shadows that if I wanted to get married while I was in graduate school and start having children so I wouldn't be 40 years old with a one-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. That that was okay. I wish somebody would have told me that it was okay because I would have made some very different choices personally um, that might have had some different effects professionally. So that's what I would um, from your experiences, um, yours specifically really, um, what would you say to someone who does have a struggling family mm -hmm. in terms of really just what society kind of feels about them? Because I live um, with a great aunt and a sister, so it, it gets very um, tension rising and mm -hmm. people kind of look at it differently. So how do you think um, in terms of families, how would you deal with that or come about that? Wow, I think every family situation is different. And really, you have to find a way to, to cope with what your family situation is. Mm -hmm. my, my coping was trying to be Little Miss Perfect. Mm -hmm. And literally, like, it wasn't the best thing to do. Um, and so I would urge anyone who has a difficult family situation to seek counseling, because a lot of times counselors can help you um, find clarity around an issue so that you learn that it's OK to forge your own path. You know, counseling was not all the rage when I was, it was not, not I won't say all the rage, it wasn't a commonly access, access service, especially when you live in a small town of 1,500 people and everybody knows your business and they're looking for you because you're such and such and such and such a right. daughter, so <laughs> let's just see how she's going to mess up because she tries to be exactly. Miss Polly Perfect all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So literally, like, you know, I think... Um, with, with that type of family dynamic and family situation, you really do, I think, seeking counseling services to help you navigate around the difficulties that you might find in that situation would be appropriate, you know? Yeah. Um, and then also having an outlet that's yours, like something that you like to do that is yours. It's, if it's knitting, that's your thing, mm -hmm. you know? It, whatever it is, but having an outlet that's yours. Yeah. Uh. Um, yeah, so I've been part of a campaign that Professor Torek helped me out with, um, and Professor Frazier had my back with uh, LaSalle Talks Mass Incarceration. So we were trying to raise awareness to the issue on a broad scale and bring it into like, you know, the school's own issues and like diversity and inclusion. So me and Jesse worked really hard with making sure it happened and it was stressful and it turned out to be a great success, but we both left defeated at the end of it with the way the school administration and like you know I try not to always bash on him but our president's never at these type of events um, so I'm never really it sets an example when people from the higher ups don't come to these things so I've been I'm a I like to do like campaigns and ideas I've been brainstorming an idea called like a hashtag thanks LaSalle and with the new house that he bought with all the money that we pay for it doesn't make me feel that happy inside, and I know it doesn't make feel many students and faculty as well. So I was thinking of like a, a whiteout, and I figured I'd talk to you people about it because you guys would understand where we'd all gather in front of the, his lawn and just say hashtag thanks LaSalle for any type of racial like biases or times in class he felt like you were screwed or whatever the case may be. And I've talked about it with some students, and some students say that's a great idea, but like I actually want to get the ball rolling on this and maybe like maybe like an inclusive thing for everybody on campus, especially the students that felt like they've been like marginalized. So I, I want to know what you guys think about that. I, I know that everyone is a part of the LaSalle staff here, so as, as a non-member, that may be a different approach to the protest. I think it's a great idea in what the message that you want to get across, but uh, maybe like his front lawn um, of his home not the best. Well, I figured we would be polite. We'd tell campus police. We would inform him. It wouldn't be like we'd show up and we, it would be peaceful. You know, just okay, like everything. Testing. Yeah, it would just be more like an awareness and something that, make an event at his house because not many people are really aware of it and anything like that. I definitely probably would have to have more expertise on what you guys have been going through on campus for that, so. Um, so I would, First, I'd say uh, I'd encourage anybody who works at LaSalle not necessarily to comment on that. Because um, uh, I think folks have just got to be careful. Um, and I know I didn't hear everything that you had to say specifically, so there may be some details that I missed too, myself. Um, uh, 
what is it, uh, culpable deniability? Mm-hmm. 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 Um, so, I heard. <laughs> exactly. Um, here's, I think there's a reality that um, folks have to make choices as far as um, how they want to be heard and how they're going to, what's the kind of change that, um, that we want to make? Um, and what is going to be the best way to um, strategically make that change? Um, so I think anytime you um, uh, make a decision, anytime you um, identify a problem, um, recognize that there is, um, you want to make sure you know what your end goal is, um, and you want to make sure that you can be as clear as possible in terms of what it is you want and what your values are, and then leave room um, in the aftermath for a conversation. There's a reality that um, if you engage in something like that, there will be some people who are going to tune you out and are just going to say, okay, wait, this person isn't being reasonable, this person isn't being rational, they're not listening, etc. And along with that, there are going to be people who will absolutely pay attention and people who will respond and will say, whoa, I, I needed that in order to, um, to be heard. I needed somebody to speak that strongly and that powerfully so I could recognize how much pain that they're in and what it is like to experience this day to day. Um, so if anybody sort of wants to go down that path, just like there are going to be some people who um, can have a different kind of conversation, it's a backroom conversation, and it's basically, look, I don't know if you realize this, but there are people who are here, they go to event after event, they don't see senior management, and they're asking the question, what is it that people really care about here? Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to make sure you recognize that. I don't know if those voices come to you, and I think sometimes because of your title, people are intimidated, but there's a set of your presence and your absence what you choose to say and what you choose not to say makes a statement. And I just want to make sure you know that and you make the decisions around that. Um, I think that there are pros and cons to either approach. Um, I think we have to strategically decide how do we want to position ourselves and what are the risks that are associated with that. And then the other piece is um, during the times when I have been the most outspoken and radical and taking the mo- most risks, um, you, uh, it's absolutely... But I say amen to the statement because that was small. I agree. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, but how do you go about even like sometimes your own race or culture bringing down your own self-worth? So the amount of times that I've heard like being Latina saying like, Oh, you should just go clean houses, or like, or like be like Mary Rich or something. Like, as a woman and stuff, like your own culture and hearing that from your own race just tearing down self worth and women. Like, I feel like, how do you go about that? I'm gonna answer the question. Okay. Uh, Miss Rosa cleans my house. Miss Rosa washes my children. Miss Rosa helps me maintain my sa- my sanity. Miss Rosa has held me when I have cried. That woman is Latina. She cleans my house, but she is my sanity. So don't ever let anybody say that that is not a worthy thing. And you pay good money to my, do yeah, it I as know. well, right? <laughs> so, so don't don't let anybody like um, downplay that type of role because I'm telling you, whenever you see a strong, they say whenever you see like a strong man, there's a woman walking right beside him, whatever. Whenever you see a strong woman realize that she has a tribe of other strong women that are walking right behind her. And that is real. Because that woman helps hold me together. Okay? So, I just had to put that out there. Because, yeah. I'm so, yeah, no. That's, that's not something to be. But it, when you basically, I think you have to make sure that, again, your tribe is strong. You know, the voices that influence you are strong, and you're not listening to the person who says, well, what are they doing? You know, what are you doing? How are you all of a sudden an expert on what I should be doing? Because I actually have dreams and talents and, and goals that I want to realize. So how are you realizing your goals in your own life? Throw it back on the end. It's telling you what you need to do. What are you doing? <laughs> I also think that, and this also kind of, I think, touches on what you were saying about family too. I think that like the 
at its essence, we think of like a traditional family, but family is something I think that goes beyond that in some capacities. Family is something that you can choose. Um, so like your mom and dad might not be who you consider your family, it might be your friends. Um, it might be um, aunts and uncles, it could be like cousins or whoever. And I think that while we have like, um, as like people, as, like a, as, a, as a world, we think of family in this, dip, in this certain context, but that's not necessarily the way in which individually we have to see it. So I think that if, it's, if it is like the family that's maybe putting you down, then you have, you have to find some folks who are more family than them who will build you up. And I think that um, those people, um, those are voices you'd be listening to, those people who are encouraging you, um, pushing you to, to do good things, to, to, that are supporting you in, every, in all of your endeavors. The question that you're asking to share the presentation. Um, I really echo what other folks have shared um, uh, in terms of uh, having the community that's around us that's absolutely critical and folks that we can go to. What helps me, um, I think, with that is to recognize that there are ways that people, um, in situations when we receive messages like that, what I find is there are a couple of different things that usually play a role in that. Um, the first, I think, sadly, is um, what oftentimes folks will call horizontal, uh, horizontal hostility or crabs in the back. And basically what that means is when you have a group of people or when you have folks who are together who have experienced some kind of oppression or marginalization, it's not safe to respond to that oppression by going to the oppressors and saying, look, what you're doing is just jacked up and you're not okay and I'm gonna whatever. And so, sadly, what winds up happening is people let that fester and then we project that out to the people who are safe, uh, who seem to be safe targets. And those are people who sadly are like us, who have that oppressed status, who aren't sort of in positions of power. And so we can have a tendency, unfortunately, to try to tear each other down. Not necessarily because people are understanding what they're doing or they're trying to be hurtful per se, but there's a way in which um, folks will take that rage and sadly we tend to turn it on each other. Um, and I find that that is not just on people who um, uh, sort of share our culture. So I identify as a multiracial African American um, uh, or black. I can't I just say I'm black. Um, uh, light skin, either black. So certainly there are ways in which folks within my community will go after each other um, at times. But I think the other piece is oftentimes there are ways in which that plays itself out with even within that community with different targets. So often. Uh, within some contexts, there's, there may be a lot of homophobia. There is a lot of patriarchy and a lot of ways in which people feel like, hey, I, as a man, am sort of up here. So recognize that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, it's not about you. It's just about people who have their crap, and sadly, that's getting projected onto you. So recognize that and hold on to that context. I think the other piece, um, the ways in which I think that um, something like that comes about is a lot of people are afraid that when you go and you achieve your success, you're gonna be leaving them. So it's less about, oh, I'm going to a community and I'm going someplace else um, because I wanna lift us all forward, but it's more about as you move forward, you're gonna be leaving us behind too. And that's a really, uh, unfortunately, a very scary thing for a lot of folks. Um, so I was the first person in my family to go to uh, college. Um, my dad never graduated from high school. Uh, both my parents went to all black schools. My dad never graduated from high school. Uh, he was a forklift driver, um, uh, tow truck driver as well, security guard. My mom um, did graduate from high school, but um, uh, most of her siblings did not. Um, she had, I think, uh, six or seven brothers, all but one of them had to uh, stop going to school beyond third grade because they had to go work in the sugarcane farms. And so for many of those family members, they associated upward mobility with this idea of you're gonna think that you're better than us and you're gonna move beyond and away from us. And I know even with my own um, father, there were a whole host of messages where on one hand he was proud of my success, but he was also like, well, don't think you're gonna be something or you're never gonna be anything. Um, recognize that that, um, if you can allow folks to feel valued and know that you love them and care for them, and that you can also convey, I love so much of what you taught me, which was to persevere and to work hard 
and I see people who are around me that don't work anywhere near as hard as you, and I want you to know how much I admire you and I respect you, and I'm going to carry that with you forward, then there's less fear of, oh, she's leaving us, and more fear of she's going someplace, or more of, of a belief that she's going someplace and she's going to take us with them. And I think that that helps out a lot. Um, I just want to pinpoint real quick that um, we have 15 more minutes, and I know there's a couple of hands that still go up. I just want to ask at this time if there's anything that the panelists want to just say openly about your industry or just anything in general before the last few minutes questions, because we do. We don't want to run over time. <laughs> so. Lakota's hands yes. been up for a while, so I want yes. to. Yeah, I have a question. So if you gave advice to your, uh, your senior, your senior college staff, what would it be like one piece of advice? Senior college staff. Yeah, like if you graduate college, what would it be like? What's like two pieces of advice you would give yourself, like you younger yourself? Um, networking, connecting, I was telling someone that prior to uh, starting the panel, getting to know everybody's name in here, you guys should all be connected, social media is the easiest way to connect, but someone in here is your next CEO, your next mm -hmm. manager, your next advisor, at a call. connect with them, you guys don't know where each other are going to end up or if you're going to need to use that other person as a crutch, recommendation, whatever, uh, just information. Connect. I want to make sure I connect with all of my panelists here because, again, we're all different. We all have some different source of information that is going to be applicable sooner or down, down the line. So, connect. Well, I just want to say before I leave, I want to encourage our you all, you young people, just this month is Black History Month, and you know, it is an old spiritual song that says, don't let nobody turn you around. Just keep on pushing and keep on moving and keep on achieving because better days are ahead. And I want to thank all of you all and especially my granddaughter. It's a beautiful, a beautiful uh, night that she's, you know, her co-work is helped put together. But she's got that her grandmother spirit. She's an achiever, and I'm proud of that. And she's going to go places, and sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. So keep on pushing. And don't forget, as I was taught, you got to put God first in everything we do, because He makes the difference a lot of times. We don't realize that, but he will make the difference. If we just acknowledge him in everything that we do, I'm a firm believer of that. So in, be encouraged, all of you all, to keep moving ahead. No matter how high it may get, and no matter what who gets to try to get in your way, just keep going. Don't let nobody turn you around. Is everybody responding to the question, Lakota? Is that no, what you want? She, didn't, she wasn't in a scapegoat. <laughs> 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 Do you want everybody to respond to that question? Well, I think everyone has their own like, you know, like, all right, so if you give advice to like a 21 year old son or daughter, like, what would it be? You know, like, one of these things. One, continue to work hard. When you work hard, you work hard. And also play hard. Yeah. When you play hard, you play hard. <laughs> and definitely learn how to separate the two. <laughs> you remember talking about this in college. When it was time to work hard, people were like, where is Monica? I, I don't know. I think she's uh, in her No, she's not in the room. No, I think she went to the library. Nobody knew where my study place was. Nobody. But when it was time to party, I was leaving the strolls for my sorority. <laughs> <laughs> at the front of the dance line. And they said, how does she make such good grades? But she parties with me. How does she do this? Right? Work hard, play hard. Continue to do it. This, this approach will sustain you. Just be able to separate and know what to do each, each one. That's my
my advice to my kids. I would say breathe. Um, breathe deeply because <laughs> I think that as a senior in college, you, uh, you're trying to do all these different things. You're trying to wrap up your college experience. You're trying to think about what's next, whether that's employment or graduate school or what have you. And um, at 20, 21, I was making decisions for my life and I knew nothing. And I made some decisions, um, even in terms of my area, my field, that I probably would have changed had I slowed down a little bit and given myself a little time to find out what it was about. So I think breathe and, and realize that you need a plan. But I, I talk to students a lot in this age group, and their plans are very detailed. So by 25, I'm going to do this. By 30, I'm going to do this. <laughs> because, because it never works out the way you think it's going to. But it's okay, because however it works out, it's still okay. It's going to be fine. So I think um, recognizing that you need a plan, but knowing that it will not work out the way you think, and you'll be able to handle it however life you know, comes your way. I also say that um, what, be comfortable with telling people no. Um, and, and I think at that point, when you're like, just about to end school and you're looking for positions and you're on the job hunt and your family's saying we should be here because you're close to us and your other side's saying we should go here because you have to tell people no because you need to figure out maybe not necessarily what's best for you in the long run, but what, what you're thinking is best for you in the moment. Um, and I think that um, you sometimes have to tune people out and just tell them no. And I think that um, that's challenging. Um, I, think, I don't know if it gets any easier when you get older, but um, it's a good time to start practice. I guess for me it would be to advocate for myself more. Um, I feel like I'm a person who accepts what is giving to me, given to me or what other people think I deserve. So I feel like if I advocated more for myself, I could receive more opportunities. Um, so yeah, advocate for yourself. Um, so I wish everything that they said had been told to me when I'm, I was 21. That would help a lot. Um, and a lot of what comes to mind for me is um, uh, very similar with that. I, I guess the only thing that I add um, that's a slight um, derivation off of what was said, um, take time to get to know ourselves. Um, I think sometimes we are in such, um, we want to be successful so much and we want to make so many people happy uh, who are around us that oftentimes we don't stop to say, okay, what exactly do I want? And what is it that feeds my soul, um, and why do I want uh, what I'm chasing? Um, and I just wish I had stopped um, and not been so focused on what is it that everybody wants me to be, and instead took some time to say, okay, who am I, and what do I want for me? And that would have helped. Last question. Real quick. I didn't talk about it. This is something that Brittany and I talk about a lot because like, as I'm looking in the room, like, there's a whole bunch, there's a whole lot more people of color at our campus, but it's like nobody is here. At like the MSU meetings, again, there's a whole lot of people of color at the campuses, but not a lot of people show up. So like as professional people who, have, who are older than me and who've seen a little bit more, like what do you guys think that we could do to be more communal? Because I feel like as people of color, we kind of have an obligation to stick together and to show up to things like this and to like help each other out. But it, it, it's hard to do that when people don't, like come so like how do you how do we do stuff like that to bring more unity? For me, I have a similar situation for my um, the school community that I'm at right now, where um, the parents are not advocating for their children. A lot of my um, school population they're on IEPs with it, which is like the special education plans, um, and a lot of their needs are not being met. And I feel like at other schools, those needs are being matched because the, the parents, they take, they advocate for their children. Talk about advocating. They advocate for their children, and they, um, those services that the kids need um, are being met. And it's a lot of black parents. A lot of them are immigrants. They don't know how to come together to kind of speak up for their kids. So I, do, I would love some advice on that. How, would, how do I help my, um, my parents advocate for their kids, like come together? and be more vocal so that the kids can get the help for um, their needs met. 
So you say more people show up at MSU meetings than you see here. No, it's not like, well, I mean, like, some, it varies. Yeah. Like, sometimes there would be a lot of people, sometimes there isn't. But it's like, I feel like we should be more consistent. Like, every MSU meeting, as many people of color, really just people yeah. in general should be there to show each other that we're here to support each other. Yeah. Because it's like, I feel like, no matter how much positive things that we do, if it's that, if we're not, like, helping each other, it's almost going to slip through the cracks, or it's not going to be as effective as like, who's working together. Just to, like, further explain that, I just think that on this campus, as a person of color, one of two groups here, if um, you try to advocate for yourself, you're known as that person who's constantly advocating for yourself. And then that's those are the people that like we kind of group together. And then the, those people that like I kind of don't want to be known as an angry black person, constantly having to defend yes. myself and my actions, so I'm going to separate myself from all the other people of color, you know. I just, to pinpoint that, I always say, like, don't say you're for the culture if you don't help the culture. You know what I mean? I mean, I think this is a prime time, the day that we live. I live this every single day, like, you know, just, you know, doing cultural things because we want to make a statement that we matter and stuff like that. But also, it's like, I'm all about equality, and I love my white people. Those are woke. Um, <laughs> And like, you know, I always try to make them understand like my side. You have to understand our history are built on textbooks about literally white people and we skip over slavery. We skip over all the like great things that black people do. So now it's just, it's not that let's make black people A1. It's not about that. It's let me show you what I'm capable of. I'm just as capable of you. I'm not telling you to stop repping your white culture. Shoot, I go to all the what? Um, what is it? <laughs> 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 um, what, um, you know, April fifteenth. I'm not gonna talk about it, but that's my favorite white culture. Okay. Um, you know what I'm saying? But it's the <laughs> y'all all know. But anyway, um, <laughs> that's the next day, right? No, sixteenth. Sixteenth this year. Yeah. America, Monday. Oh, 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 okay. But, I feel like that's what we lack and that's what people don't understand and it's especially hard being on this campus because once you open your mouth as a person of color, I guarantee you you get the eye rolls, you get the, you get the, there goes that black girl again, I see it every single day, but I'm not going to stop shining. You got to bring stop. a buddy to these events, so do you, you know like two other people that you don't see here that you would think, wait, wait a minute, I thought they would be here. Like, I know two of you who I think should be here, but like, yeah, <laughs> bring them up. <laughs> Listen, I can tell you this, all right? When I was in college, I used to bring people and stuff, and they used to be like, um, I'll buy you a beer if you come to me with this, yeah. to this thing, or I'll buy you a coffee if you come to this thing, right? And literally, I would, I would bring people. <laughs> it worked. I would bring people, yeah, right? Or then I was, and I went to a very different college. I went to an HBCU. So I would also shame people in the coming, like for real. Okay. <laughs> X, Y, Z. Come on now. Right. So let me quickly, um, if I can, because uh, there's a couple things I want to build on, and I know we're tight on time. Um, one, I think it's critical to keep doing them, um, even if you, it's so much about this is about momentum, mm -hmm. and it really is. And it may be you get a couple of folks who come out. And they come to the first time and they catch a spark and they're like, whoa, that's different. And it is, it may be <clears throat> discouraging because we have these numbers sort of built up and these images in our mind, but just recognize we've got to keep going and sort of building that kind of momentum. And absolutely, I echo what um, Brittany talks about as far as um, standing in solidarity. If we have people from other marginalized groups and people who are, um, are really working in solidarity with us, um, whether it's people of color, pigmentally, de uh, pigmentally deficient folks, uh, whether it's LGBT community members or whatever, um, really trying to build that coalition and move forward. I think the other thing I just want to make sure that I acknowledge is there are ways that oftentimes when we talk about race, it can very much be uh, um, a black-white dialogue. And it's sort of like, okay, well, we have black folks and then sort of white folks, and there are ways that there are a lot of racialized groups and racialized experiences that are being overlooked with that. So I do want to acknowledge um, our uh, brothers and sisters, uh, whether they're uh, First Nations, Native American, American Indian, however that's labeled, our Latino brothers and sisters, our Asian brothers and sisters, um, folks from a whole host of communities. Um, uh, I just want to make sure that we're acknowledging them too.
Um, if you have any last minute things, you're more than welcome to talk to the panelists um, uh, on your own time. <laughs> Can you let Brandy, she took all the time to record. Yeah. You gotta let her answer, ask her a question. Yeah. Oh. Because yeah, she was so nice to us. Yeah. Oh. oh, I mean, round of applause for her. Oh. It's kind of crazy, so literally a week before, I, I did have a different panelist group here. Um, um, actually, one before this event uh, told me that they couldn't make it, so again, switching up. But it's kind of crazy that, you know, when things get pulled together, and I'm just really happy. I'm, I'm thankful, and I hope we get to do this again and see your faces again, because you guys are very insightful, thoughtful. I mean, I literally can't thank you guys enough. But to thank you, uh, we did get you a gift in the back. It's those cool little things just to show our appreciation because we definitely mean it. Like I know it's a Friday night. I know a lot of people are seeing Black Panther right now, so for you guys to be here, we need to be to us. A um, couple of things. One thing I will say, you are able to take the centerpieces home. However, not the flags. Leave the flags. Um, they're scented, they're, they smell good. Um, I know college drugs smell anywhere, so you might just want to take one. Um, also, if you want to take any of the food that's left over, the drinks, I don't want them. I don't want them in my car either, so take them. And also, did everyone get a pencil? No? Okay. Serena Slack on the job. <laughs> Yo, I'm gonna throw you underneath the bus since you have the nerve to throw me underneath the bus. But you I didn't say nothing. <laughs> Did you think so? <laughs> you didn't say nothing. You picked the wrong person to throw me the bus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's always ready for me. I know. Um, and again, I mean, I mean, there isn't much to say. If you want to network with any of the panelists, um, please feel free to do so. Thank you. I mean, and like, props to Brittany and thank you, Brittany. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? I, I forgot to shout out a few people. Shout out to Tim and Amy. We definitely helped. Lakota helped out too. Uh, Brandy for filming. I'm forgetting anyone that helped out. I got Kathy back there. That's no. Kate. Catherine. Katie. 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 Uh. So I don't know, I'm gonna get the Kathy out of my head. <laughs> it's crazy, because you know when people start bringing around, I get mad, so I don't know. But anyway, yeah, and um, don't forget anything else. No, no. And then thank all of you guys for coming. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You do a part two. Huh? So you need to do a part two. Yes. Awesome. Remember for the culture, don't forget. <laughs> Take this one with you, please. You know, learn about your panelists, look them up. I'm pretty sure it's later. You can find you out.